Welcome to the CBS Radio Mystery Theater Archives, the only YouTube channel which has the original classic episodes of the CBS Radio Mystery Theater in order with no ads. Thank you for listening, and now, enjoy the show. Marshall. Some 38 years ago, back in World War II days, a famous line was born. It was part of a song which goes like this. There'll always be an England while there's a busy street, wherever there's a turning wheel, a million marching feet, to which the authors might have added. And as long as there's an England, there'll always be a Sherlock Holmes. Which one of you is Holmes? My name, sir. But you have the advantage of me. I'm Dr. Grimsby Roylott of Stoke Moran, and I know you, you scoundrel. You're Holmes the meddler, Holmes the busybody. Stay out of my affairs. When you go out, close the door, for there's a decided draft. Just see that you keep yourself out of my grip, or I swear to see to it that you roast in hell. <laughs> mystery drama, The Adventure of the Speckled Band, was adapted from the Sherlock Holmes classic, especially for the Mystery Theater, by Murray Burnett, and stars Kevin McCarthy. It is sponsored in part by Sinoff, the sinus medicines, and Exlax. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Macho is the in word today when rating male performers. Either the performer in question has it or he hasn't. It's very similar to the days of Eleanor Glynn when she made the word it synonymous with sex appeal. When we think of Sherlock Holmes, we dismiss the idea of his having macho, and that's a big mistake. It seems that whenever a beautiful young lady was in distress, Sherlock Holmes was the first man she turned to for help at any hour of the day or night. Watson! Watson, wake up! Sorry to rouse you, but... Oh, 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 Holmes. Aren't you feeling well? No, I'm perfectly fit, thank you. But it seems that there's a young lady who roused Mrs. Hudson, who in turn roused me, and she's waiting in our sitting room this very minute. What, at this hour? Mm -hmm. Trust you, Watson, to hit the nail on the head. When young ladies wander about London at this hour of the morning and get sleepy people out of their beds, come on now, I assume that it's something very pressing that she has to communicate. Yes, of course. That's exactly what I was thinking. Then I was thinking that if it proves to be an interesting case, you might want to follow it from the very beginning. But if you prefer to finish your sleep... No, 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 Holmes. I, I wouldn't miss it for anything. Good morning, madam. My name is Sherlock Holmes. This is an... Well, an intimate friend of mine and an associate, Dr. Watson, before whom you can speak as freely as before myself. Ah, I'm glad to see that Mrs. Hudson has had the good sense to light the fire. Please, draw up to it, and I'll order you a cup of hot tea, for I observe that you're shivering. I'm not shivering from the cold. Hmm? What then? Fear, Mr. Holmes. It's terror. Well, if you'll trust us, perhaps we can soon set matters right. You came in by train this morning, I see. You know me, then? No, no, but I observed the second half of a return ticket in the palm of your left glove. You must have started very early, and yet you had a long drive in a dog cart along heavy roads before you reached the station. Oh, I've come to the wrong place. They've been here before me, and you know all about it. No, no, please, please, madam, forgive my clumsiness. No, no, don't be alarmed. It's just that my enthusiasm for the science of deduction is sometimes misplaced. I don't understand. The explanation is simple. The left arm of your jacket is spattered with mud in no less than seven places. The marks are perfectly fresh. Hmm? There's no vehicle other than a dog cart which throws up mud in that way. And then only when you sit on the left-hand side of the driver for some time. Uh, however you reached your conclusions, you're perfectly correct. 
And I see I was wrong to mistrust you. Mm. Uh, Mildred Farintosh was right when she said you are the one to turn to in an hour of need. Farintosh, eh? Ah, uh-huh. That was before your time, Watson. <laughs> it was concerned with an opal tiara, I recall it now. I mm-hmm. hope that you can help me shed the horror and darkness which surrounds me. At present, I can't reward you for your services, but in a month or six weeks, I shall be married with full control of my own income, and then you shall not find me ungrateful. Now, don't disturb yourself about rewarding me. Let us hear your problem. My name is Helen Stoner. I live with my stepfather, Dr. Grimsey Roylett, mm-hmm. who's the last survivor of one of the oldest Saxon families in England, mm-hmm. the Roylets of Stoke Moran on the western border of Surrey. Mm-hmm. The name is familiar to me. Ah, well, then perhaps you know that the Roylett family was at one time among the richest in England, but four successive heirs of wasteful and dissolute habits mm-hmm. mortgaged the estates to the hilt, and the taxes did the rest. My stepfather seeing that he must adapt to new conditions, took a medical degree and went to Calcutta, where he established a large practice. Does he practice in Surrey now? Oh, no, never. Uh, No one would come to him. Ah, why not? Because of his temper. The villagers are afraid of him. Only last week he threw the local blacksmith over a bridge and into a stream. Don't say. It was only by paying all the money I could get together that I was able to avert another public exposure. But surely your stepfather must have displayed some of these symptoms to you or your mother before she... No, no, no. You you don't understand. My mother was the young widow of Major General Stoner of the Bengal Artillery. We were only two years old at the time of my mother's remarriage. We? Oh, my twin sister, Julia. Uh Uh-huh. She's dead. Mm. And it's about her death that I want to speak with you. In a moment. You say you and your sister were only two years old when your mother married Dr. Roylett. Now, even so, surely there must have been some indication of this violent temper that you speak of. Not then. There seemed to be no obstacle to our happiness. It was only after he caught our native butler in some robberies and beat him to death that the violent side of his nature was revealed and... Never to us, never. I'm sure... I'm sure that... Mm. Yes, madam. Yes. Sure of what? That if my mother were still alive, we'd be happy again. Ah. When and how did she die? Eight years ago, in a railway accident near Crewe. And your sister? That's the horror, Mr. Holmes. That's why I'm here. It was just two years ago... Just a fortnight before her wedding day. Mr. Holmes, we were twins, terribly close. And I remember her telling me how she had dreaded telling Papa about her forthcoming marriage. She described it so vividly. I can almost hear her now as Papa called to her outside the house. Julia? Julia? Yes, Papa? Julia, you and your twin sister are so close. And yet it's different as night from day. Now, Helen wouldn't have asked to see me in my study and then avoided coming here. I'm sorry, Papa. It's just that, well, I wasn't sure you'd like what I have to tell you. There's only one way to find out. All right. I've met a man. I love him. He loves me. And we're going to be married. Julia, my child, how would you think I'd be anything but overjoyed to hear that you're going to be happy... And with someone who cares for you. Who's the lucky fellow? An army major. You'll like him. His name is Robert Drury. But it was really about Helen that I want to speak. Helen? What is she to do with it? Papa, she can't run this house alone. She must have help. It's been almost too much for both of us. And now that I'm just about to leave... Don't worry. Don't worry. I'll find someone to give Helen a hand with the housekeeping. You'll have other things on your mind, like your trousseau and the things a young woman thinks about when she's getting married. And did he find someone to help you, Miss Stoner? No servant would stay in the house more than a day or two, not only because of my stepfather's terrible rages, but also because my stepfather brought over animals from India and left them free to roam. Mm. There is a cheetah and a baboon there now. Mm, I see. Not the darkest part you don't, Mr. Holmes, not yet. 
that awful moment of my sister's death. My entire attention is yours. Please proceed. Well, to understand how I came to overhear what happened between my stepfather and my sister, you must know about the sleeping arrangements in the manor house. As I said, it's very old and only one wing is inhabited. All three bedrooms in this wing are on the ground floor with windows opening onto the lawn outside. My stepfather's bedroom was after Julia's and mine. There are no connecting doors. Well, on this particularly hot night, shortly before my sister was to be married, my windows were wide open, and thus I came to hear the following conversation. Well, hello, Julia. Can't sleep, eh? Is it the heat or nerves about your forthcoming marriage? A little of both, Papa. <laughs> Plus that cigar you're smoking, it's so strong the breeze blows the smoke right into my bedroom. Oh, sorry, sorry. Here, I'll get rid of it. Is there uh, anything you wanted to say to me, Julia? Well, as a matter of fact, there is. Please don't think me foolish, but have you ever heard anyone whistle in the dead of night? Whistle? Oh, no, never. I don't suppose you could possibly... Whistle yourself in your sleep sometimes. Oh, my dear girl, you're just a bundle of nerves. Um, when do you think you hear this uh, whistle? For the past three nights. Always at the same time, about three o'clock in the morning, I hear this low, clear whistle. I I'm a very light sleeper and it wakes me. Did you investigate at all? Do you think you know where it came from? I can't be sure. It may have been from the lawn or from one of the rooms. Have you asked Helen about this? Of course, but she sleeps very heavily and she hasn't heard anything. I, I just wondered if you had. <laughs> Not a thing, my dear Julia. Uh, it's all in your head. I wouldn't worry about it if I were you. And had your sister asked you about this whistle? Oh, yes. I told her that it must be coming from the gypsy camp that my father allows off on the hills. Hmm. But surely those hills must be some way off? Yes, but sounds carry in the night, don't they? Possibly, possibly. Go on. The night of my sister's death, there was a terrible storm. I felt a terrible sense of unease, even though I knew we had locked ourselves in because of the animals I told you about. And suddenly, amid all the uproar of the gale, there burst forth the wild scream of a terrified woman. I knew it was my sister's voice. I sprang from my bed, wrapped a shawl around me, and rushed into the corridor. There, the sounds of the storm were somewhat abated, and I thought I heard a low whistle and a clanging sound as if metal had fallen. As I ran down the passage, my sister's door opened slowly, and she stood there, swaying. And then she fell to the ground, and in a strangled voice, cried out, Oh, my Lord, Helen, the band, the speckled band. There have been fantastically imaginative horrors and thrills invented by all the great writers of horror and suspense stories. But nothing any of them ever came up with has topped the good old-fashioned scream in the night for pure heart-stopping terror. We'll be back with Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson in Act Two. Great talkers abound in history and fiction. But I have a nomination for an unsung category. The Great Listener. When you consider Dr. Watson, here's one of the greatest listeners of all time. Not only did he act as a sounding board for Sherlock Holmes and his deductions, but he also listened to many of the tales told by Holmes' clients without saying more than a few words while recording what he heard. I'd sat both fascinated and horrified that early morning, listening to Helen Stoner tell of her sister's scream of anguish in the night and her last words before she was seized by convulsions and sank to the floor. And, and then, Miss Stoner, did your sister say anything else? She tried to, but she was choking. I called for my stepfather and he came out of his room in his dressing gown. 
By the time he reached my sister's side, she was unconscious, and all his attempts to revive her failed. And those attempts were? He poured brandy down her throat, chafed her wrists, tried artificial respiration, but, but to no avail. She died without recovering consciousness. Mm. Now, but all this happened two years ago. What brings you to me here now, at this hour, and obviously in mortal fear? Because, Mr. Holmes, I'm now sleeping in my sister's room. Hmm? Why? It was necessary due to repairs being made on the house, and last night, last night, Mr. Holmes, I distinctly heard a long, low whistle. Holmes asked if it would inconvenience my wife too much to have Miss Stoner as a house guest for the remainder of the day until he could gather some very necessary information. Then he would decide how we should all proceed. I took her to a hansom, gave the driver my address, and I'd no sooner returned when the door to the sitting room literally burst open. Framed in the doorway was a tall man, his face burned yellow from the sun with deep-set, flashing eyes that glared balefully at us. Which one of you rogues is Holmes? My name, sir, but you have the advantage of me. I am Dr. Grimsby Roylott of Stoke Moran. Indeed, Doctor. Pray take a seat. I'll do nothing of the kind. My stepdaughter has been here. I traced her, and I was too late to stop this other scoundrel from sending her off in a cab. You're Holmes, the meddler. Holmes, the busybody. Uh, when you go out, close the door, for there's a decided draft. I'll go when it pleases me. And it pleases me to have my say. You do well to listen, because I'm a dangerous man to fall afoul of. Here, see this poker? I'll twist you just as easily as I twist this and throw you away like this. Now, see that you keep yourself out of my grip. Hmm. <laughs> he seems quite a likable chap. Now... <laughs> I'm not quite so bulky or broad in the shoulder, but if he'd remained, I might have shown him that my grip was not so much more feeble than his own. My <laughs> word, Holmes. <laughs> You've straightened the poker out again. Yes. And I hope I have as much success in straightening out what I perceive to be a, a dark and sinister affair. We'll meet at your house in three hours, Watson. Right, right. After I've walked down to Doctor's Commons, where I hope to get some helpful data. Holmes was as good as his word. And exactly three hours later, he joined me and Miss Stoner in our living room. My wife had gone out to do some shopping. Where Holmes held in his hand a sheet of blue paper, scrawled with notes and figures. After the greeting, I... I handed him a telegram which had come to Baker Street addressed to Miss Stoner, care of my friend. Hmm? What's this? It's a telegram from my fiancé, Peter Armitage. How did he know where to send it? Uh, we'd discussed my fears for some time, and I'd mentioned I might turn to you. I assume that when he'd heard I was off to London, he took a chance. Hmm. I'm coming up to London soonest. On no account, return to Stoke Moran. All my love, Peter... Your fiancé seems to have a head on his shoulders. But I must go back, Mr. Holmes. My stepfather will be... He's here in London, hot on your heels, and with fire in his eyes. He threatened me. Oh, then what am I to do? He's a terrible person when he's crossed. I think, Miss Stoner, that we should go immediately to Stoke Moran. But, but I don't understand. He said Peter was giving me good advice about staying in London. Now you advise... Don't your stepfather come off into London... No. And when he does, does he return the same day? He usually stays overnight to transact all of his business. Then that's the very reason why I think you and Watson, can you make it, my dear fellow? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Should get there as quickly as possible, because it's only on the scene that we'll find the answer to the mystery. Well, I, I should need a half hour to pack. Don't forget to take along a longer revolver. <laughs> Miss Stoner, you did wisely in coming to see me. But you haven't told me all. I've kept nothing back. You have. You're screening your stepfather. Why? What do you mean? If you'll excuse me while I push back the lace which fringes your hand here. What? Now, what about these 
five livid imprints of four fingers and a thumb. Miss Stoner, you have been cruelly used. I told you about his tempers. Well, sometimes he doesn't seem to know his own strength. Mm, but he certainly knows on which side his bread is buttered. You see, I spent some time looking at your mother's will. And the figures that I have here on this paper show that if both of you girls marry, your stepfather would have to exist on a mere pittance. The marriage of even one of you would put a serious dent in his income, whereas if neither of you marry, he does very nicely indeed. But, Mr. Holmes... Miss Stoner, you turn to me for help. Let me assure you that your stepfather is a crafty and dangerous villain. And you will have to put yourself completely in my hands if we are to save your life. You're not trying to frighten me. Indeed I am. For your own sake. Now, there are some things that I must make certain of. First, are you sure about hearing this whistle and the metallic sound on the night of your sister's death? It's my strong impression that I heard it. Mm -hmm. Was your sister dressed? No. No, she was in her nightdress. And in her right hand was found the charred stump of a match, and in her left, a matchbox. Mm -hmm. So she struck a light and looked about her when the alarm took place. Is that important? Vital. But did the coroner's jury come to any conclusions at all? None. The case was investigated with a great deal of care. But my evidence proved conclusively that my sister was quite alone when she met her death. Just how thorough was the investigation? The walls and flooring were carefully sounded and shown to be solid all around. The chimney? Is wide, but is barred with four large staples. The windows were blocked by old-fashioned shutters with broad iron bars, which were secured every night, and the door was locked from the inside. Mm -hmm. How about poison? The doctors examined her for it, but no traces were found. I ask you then, Miss Stoner, what do you believe caused your sister's death? Fright. And nervous shock. Induced by? I can't imagine. You mentioned gypsies. Were there gypsies in the plantation at the time? Well, there are nearly always some there. What do you think my sister's allusion to a band, a speckled band, has something to do with gypsy costumes? We're fishing in very deep waters, Miss Stoner. And I suggest we repair to the dining car for some tea. Oh, you and Dr. Watson can go. I feel no desire for food. If you don't mind, I'll try to take a little nap. Miss Holmes, if Dr. Roylett murdered his stepdaughter, how in the world did he accomplish it? The door, the window, and chimney were impassable. The flooring and walls were solid. Well, Julia Stoner was undoubtedly alone when she met her death. It would appear so, but then how do you account for these nocturnal whistles and the very peculiar words of the dying woman? Well, I, I can't account for any of it, Holmes, unless they were hallucinations. Not likely, because the two women would be afflicted with the same hallucination about whistles in the night. And only one of them referred to the speckled band. Oh. Well, you, you've evidently formed some conclusions. Otherwise, we wouldn't this very moment be on our way to Stoke Moran. Mm, no conclusions, my dear doctor. Only surmises, which have to be checked on the spot before I can even begin to make deductions. Mm, and these surmises? We have a vicious, seemingly unprincipled stepfather. Stepfather definitely subject to violent rages who stands to gain a good deal if his stepdaughters never marry. In addition, we have a band of gypsies camped very near Stoke Moran with whom the stepfather is on friendly terms. <laughs> now, when you add to that the fact that Miss Helen Stoner thinks she heard a metallic clang which might have been caused by one of those metal bars that secure the shutters falling back into place, yes, yes. then I feel that we must begin our investigations along these lines. Yes, and, and, and while we pursue these investigations, what about Miss Stoner? I have telegraphed her fiancé to meet us at the station and take her to Stoke Moran and wait for us. She'll be safe enough while we visit the gypsies. I think it's best for us to pose as architects 
Something to do with the alterations that are being made at the manor. Well, seems like the gypsies are breaking camp. Mm, it does indeed. That fellow over there seems to be giving the orders. Hello. Can we have a word with you? Sorry. No fortune telling today. Oh, come now. You can't be in that much of a rush to get to Saint Marie de la Mer. The festival doesn't start until late May. Who are you? Hmm? I'm Sherlock Holmes. And this is Dr. John Watson. Uh, how are you doing? We're assisting the architects in the rebuilding going on at the manor. What do you want with us? What do you know about our annual festival? Oh, I'm interested in the history of the Romany people. And I'd hope to talk with you about your friend and benefactor, Dr. Roylet. Gypsies have no friends. Mm. You don't consider it an act of friendship that Dr. Roylet allowed you to use these grounds as a campsite? We paid. With odd jobs around the banner? Doing some of your metalwork and other favors, no doubt. Woman, bring me the cards. No, 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 no. I'm not interested in the tarot. No, but you are interested in Dr. Roylet. He is why we leave today. He hasn't ordered you off. No, we leave because he asks us to stay. Could you explain that? Give me the cards, woman. Oh, surely you don't need these. Like you, Dr. Roylet knew of the Romany people and our customs. He asked questions. Now, these figures on the cards, properly interpreted, contain not only the answers to your questions, but could reveal the secret of the universe. I see. Not yet. Here. Choose a card. Very well. Ah. <laughs> the serpent of wisdom. Mm -hmm. You, sir, are not only an architect, but you travel all paths seeking knowledge. Well, I say, Holmes, that doesn't... Please, please, Watson. Mm -hmm. Allow the gentleman to tell us what he can in his own fashion. Select four more cards quickly, without thought. Mm. Satisfactory? Ah, uh, path 12. The elephant. Justice. And path 16. The goat. Or, if you please, the devil. In part 17, the falling tower. And here, the last card you selected, part 14. Death. Does that give you the information you seek? Not quite. But I must apologize to you. For what? For mistaking your calling. You're not a metal worker. What on earth was that all about? Why did you apologize for calling him a metal worker? You looked at his hands as he handled the tarot cards, Watson, but you didn't really see them. They were not the hands of a laborer, but of a card manipulator. Oh, I say, you mean that those cards you selected... Were the ones he forced on me, Watson. <laughs> and because of that, I need only to verify one more fact. To eliminate the gypsies as the speckled band. Listener, the facts which would enable you to arrive at the correct solution for the adventure of the speckled band are not yet all before you, but I promise faithfully that they'll be placed before you at the very outset of Act Three, right after these messages. The master of film suspense, Alfred Hitchcock, knew and exploited the sinister undercurrents flowing beneath the placid green and beautiful English countryside. But he didn't discover it. That vein was explored half a century or more before by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Listen now as Dr. Watson sets the scene in peaceful Surrey for the final act of the adventure of the speckled band. and I hurried back across the fields to Stoke Moran. As we neared the half-ruined building, we spied Miss Stoner. Miss Stoner. Miss Stoner. Oh, Mr. Holmes. Oh, I'm so glad to see you. My stepfather's returning this evening by the nine o'clock train. What will he say when he discovers you're here? Well, that problem will have to wait. I must make use of this time before he gets here to make my investigations. The workmen have all gone for the day? Yes. Mm. Are these windows... Opening on the lawn, I take it belong to the room in which you used to sleep. And the center ones are your sister's, and the one next to the main buildings, Dr. Roylitz. Exactly. But now I'm sleeping in the middle one. Mm -hmm. Because the repair is being made at the end wall over there. Yes. The wall doesn't seem to be in 
any pressing need of repair. That's what I thought. Hmm. All right, so much for that. Now, Miss Stoner, would you be good enough to go into your room and bar your shutters? Of course. Watson, come along and help me test my theory about the gypsies. All secure in there, Miss Stoner? Yes, Mr. Holmes. Mm Mm-hmm. Good. Watson, would you hold my magnifying glass while I try to slip this knife through a chink? Uh Not possible. As you see, Watson, nothing can be slipped through there. Now for the hinges. Those hinges are solid, Holmes. Built right into the masonry. Exactly. So, we shall have to look inside for the answer. Miss Stoner admitted us to her room, which was cozy and homey, with a gaping fireplace, plainly but nicely furnished, with a chest of drawers, dressing table, and two small wicker chairs. Holmes, how in the world did the gypsies manage to get in? No, they didn't, Watson. Oh, but the, the band, the speckled band and those tarot cards. My dear Watson, there's no way in which they could have been involved in the death of Miss Stoner's sister. Hmm? Now, let's look about here. That bell rope over your bed, Miss Stoner, where does it go? To the housekeeper's room. Hmm? It appears to be newer than the other furnishings. Uh, yes, it was put there a couple of years ago. Uh-huh. At your sister's request... No, I never heard of her using it. We always got whatever we wanted ourselves. Indeed. You'll excuse me if I take a closer look at it. The tassel actually lies upon your pillow here. Now let's see what happens if I pull it. Why, it's a dummy. It doesn't ring. It's not even attached to a wire. If you look closely, you can see it's fastened to a hook just above where the little opening for the ventilator is. See? How very absurd. I I never noticed Mm, that before. Pretty singular. Mm. What kind of a builder puts a ventilator leading into another room when, with the same amount of trouble, he might have put it where it would get the outside air? The ventilator is also quite new. Mm. Done about the same time as the bell rope. Ah, Miss Stoner, with your permission... I'd like to continue my investigation in your stepfather's room. The chamber of Dr. Grimsby Roylet was larger than that of his stepdaughter, but equally plainly furnished. A camp bed, a wooden shelf full of technical books, plain table, round wooden chair, a large iron safe where the principal things had met the eye. Holmes walked slowly around, examining them all with the keenest of interest. By any chance, do you know what's in this safe, Miss Stoner? My stepfather's business papers. Ah, you've seen inside then? Uh, Only once, some years ago. I I remember that it was full of papers. Uh There isn't a cat in it, for example. Oh, what a strange idea. What makes you ask that? This saucer of milk standing on top of it. Oh, I can't explain that. We don't have a cat, but there is a cheetah and a baboon. Mm, So you inform me, and a cheetah is just a big cat, and yet a saucer of milk wouldn't go very far in satisfying its appetite. Now, I should like to examine the seat of this chair for just a moment. Aha. Just as I thought. Well, common small dog leash. And I don't know why it should be curled upon itself and tied so as to make a small loop, if that's what you're asking. Mm, that is uncommon, Watson, isn't it? Oh, oh me, oh, me. It's a wicked world. I think I've finished in here, Miss Stoner, and it would be wise for us to leave. Miss Stoner, your life depends on doing exactly as I say. Very well, Mr. Holmes. I place myself completely in your hands. In the first place, both my friend and I must spend the night in your room. What? It must be so. Now, let me explain. First, am I correct in assuming that I can see the village inn from here? Uh, Yes, that's the crown. Excellent. And your windows are visible from there? If you have a room on the side facing the manor, yes. Ah, trust us to arrange that. Now... 
when your stepfather comes back, I fear that we cannot keep our visit a secret from him, so inform him. Well, but he's sure to ask what you were doing. Well, you will plead a migraine headache and confine yourself to your room. And then when you hear him retire for the night, open the shutters of your window, undo the hasp, and put your lamp there as a signal to us. And then, very quietly, very, very quietly, take everything you may need and go to the bedroom you formerly occupied. Can you manage there for one night? Oh, oh yes, easily, but, but, but what will you do? We shall spend the night in your room and we shall investigate the noise which disturbed you. and I had no difficulty engaging a bedroom and sitting room on the upper floor of the Crown Inn, commanding a fine view of the manor and of Miss Stoner's bedroom window. You know, Watson, I really have some scruples about taking you tonight. There's a distinct element of real danger. <laughs> Can't I be of assistance? Well, your presence might be invaluable. Well, well then I, I, I shall certainly come. You, you evidently saw more in those rooms than was visible to me. No, you saw everything I did. I just deduced a little more. Yeah, I, I saw nothing out of the ordinary, except the bow rope, and what purpose that could serve is more than I can imagine. You also saw the ventilator. Well, it's not unusual to have a small opening between two rooms. It was so small that a rat could hardly pass through it. What harm can there be in that? Well, at least... Grant me a curious coincidence of dates. A ventilator is made, a cord is hung, and a lady who sleeps in the bed dies. Doesn't that strike you? Uh, I, I can't see any connection. Did you observe anything very peculiar about the bed? Uh, I can't say I did, no. It was clamped to the floor. Did you ever see a bed fastened like that before? No, can't say I have. What purpose does that serve? The purpose for which it was intended... The lady could not move her bed. We waited patiently for some hours until just after 11. A bright light shone out from one of the manor bedrooms. Holmes sprang to his feet. That's our signal, Watson. It comes from the middle window. As we were crossing the lawn as silently as we could, a hideous and distorted figure darted out of a clump of laurel bushes and ran swiftly across the lawn. I froze instinctively and turned to Holmes. Good Lord, did you see it, Holmes? Shh. That's the baboon, Watson. No harm there, although they can be savage if they feel endangered. Ah, the shutters are open. And now, carefully... Through the windows, Doctor. <sighs> now, the least sound would be fatal to our plans. I understand, yes. Good. You're through. You're through. Good man. Now, you sit on the chair. Good. I'll stay on the edge of the bed. He must sit without a light because he would see it through the ventilator. Do not let yourself fall asleep, Watson. Your life depends on it. We heard twelve strike from the church steeple, and then one, two, and three, as we waited out our dreadful vigil. Suddenly, there was a momentary gleam of light in the direction of the ventilator. It vanished immediately, and then suddenly, a sound became audible. A gentle hissing, like a small jet of steam escaping from a kettle. The instant he heard it, Holmes was off the bed, struck a match, and was lashing furiously with his cane at the bell pull. You see it, Watson? You see it? But I saw nothing. At the moment when Holmes had struck a light, I'd heard a low, clear whistle. Holmes had ceased to strike and was looking up at the ventilator when... <laughs> I say, what can that mean, Holmes? It means that it's all over, and perhaps for the best. Take your pistol and come with me to Dr. Roylet's room. When we entered the room cautiously, a bizarre sight met our eyes. Dr. Grimsby Roylet sat in a chair beside the open door of the safe. Across his lap, 
lay the short stock with the long leash we'd seen earlier in the day. His chin was cocked upward, and his eyes fixed in a dreadful, rigid stare at the corner of the ceiling. Wound tight around his brow was a peculiar yellow band with brownish speckles. The band, Watson. The speckled band. A swamp adder. The deadliest snake in India. He died within ten seconds of being bitten. After we'd used the dog leash to thrust the reptile back into the safe and notified the county police, Holmes explained to me and Miss Stoner. Once I'd noticed the bell rope was a dummy and the bed nailed to the floor, I instantly thought about the rope being used as a bridge for something coming through the ventilator and passing to the bed. But the snake's venom, Mr. Holmes. Surely the coroner would... That type of poison is undetectable. And it would take a sharp-eyed coroner to detect the two minute punctures which would show where the snake had struck. When I saw the saucer of milk and the dog leash, the picture was complete. He had trained it by means of the whistle to return for the milk after sliding down the rope. But Holmes, how could he be sure the snake would strike? He couldn't. But sooner or later, it was bound to. That was why the seat of the chair in the doctor's room was deeply indented by his standing on it for many nights to call back the snake. Tonight, the reptile, enraged by my blows with the cane, turned on the doctor and killed him. I reread Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's stories about Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, I begin to think that part of their never-ending appeal is they create a world where injustice is served. Violence recoils upon the violent, and criminals are brought to book by the brilliant deductions of a gallant detective rather than through the impersonal use of computers. All in all, there's a lot to be said for such a world. I'll be back shortly. A forgotten man in the Sherlock Holmes stories is the young doctor who introduced Watson to Holmes. He's referred to as Young Stamford. And the chance that brought this about was when he and Watson ran into each other at the Criterion Bar in London. Insofar as I know, the Criterion is still there. I, for one, vote that a small plaque commemorating that meeting should be set up in the Criterion. And perhaps someday in the near future, it will be. Our cast included Kevin McCarthy, Court Benson, Patricia Elliott, and Jackson Beck. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time... Pleasant dreams. I hope you enjoyed this episode of CBS Radio Mystery Theater. If you enjoyed this and want to hear more, please subscribe to this channel. You can also visit my other YouTube channel by searching Mr. Brian McCarthy in the YouTube search.